Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you. Welcome to Monday of reInvent. Awesome. Well, I am super excited to see all of you here today for SVS 209, getting started building serverless and event-driven applications. Uh, just want to do a kind of a show of hands to see where we're at in the room. How many people are starting from kind of ground zero, haven't built a Lambda function, haven't worked with serverless before at all? Starting from that point. Awesome, you're in the right place. <laughs> and how many people have maybe played around, uh, maybe run a little bit of code in Lambda, tried some stuff out? Awesome, good chunk of you. And then how many people have like Lambda functions running in production, have built a couple serverless applications and are just looking to kind of refresh or learn some new best practices? Cool, a few in that group too? Excellent, so I think we have the perfect mix of people here today um, and I'm super excited to get into it. So let's see. So my name is Emily Shea. Here at AWS, I'm the head of application integration go to market. And so that's kind of my, my day job and what I do at AWS. But the talk that I'm gonna give today is actually a fair amount about my uh, personal experience and my personal story about kind of getting started with serverless and, and learning to, to build serverless applications from really no tech background or coding experience at all. So no matter where you are at kind of your, your stage of adoption, your stage of learning with serverless, there's gonna be something in this talk for you. So one thing that I have zeroed out about is that this room is full of phenomenal ideas for new applications, new features, new pieces of your life that you just want to automate or, or build something around. Uh, and we are really lucky to be in such a cool industry that really values innovation and incentivizes us to experiment and try new things and gives us these amazing tools to be able to build things with. Now the one thing that we're really lacking in is just time. Time to be able to, to put those ideas into practice, to be able to build something around them. And so what I found, and, and what I believe to be true, is that with serverless, you can spend so much less time on kind of the, the fundamentals and, and the building blocks that are true for all applications. Give all of those over to AWS, and just focus on, on the business logic and the things that make your application unique, and put all of your time into those, and get your applications out into production in the hands of your end users even faster. So what are you gonna come away with at the end of this hour so that we get to be together? Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what serverless services to use. Um, also some of the ways that you can start small and start with just a couple of AWS uh, serverless services, um, if not learn all of them all at once um, and kind of build up and evolve your application over time. Uh, we're also gonna talk about some of the best practices that I've adopted uh, over time for developer tooling and testing your serverless applications, which is always a hot topic. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about how you can evolve your application. So serverless applications are never meant to be kind of static, you build it once and now it's, it's done, it's out there. They're really meant to, to be dynamic and to iterate and as your, your customer requirements or as the needs of your application grow and change over time, you can evolve that super quickly. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how uh, I did that in practice. And fundamentally, what I'm hoping that you come away with is a sense of how building serverless and event-driven architectures that's really baked into that serverless model uh, can help you turn your ideas into an application faster. So, a little bit more about me. Uh, I mentioned my name is Emily Shea. I've been at Amazon for um, just a little over six years. And I currently lead the application integration go-to-market team. Uh, we do business development for a bunch of the serverless services that I'm gonna cover today. Um, and I've been in serverless business development for most of my years at Amazon. But uh, I really didn't start out with a tech background or any kind of technical skills when I came into the company. Um, I really kind of built that up on my own. And as I was studying for stuff like my associate SA certification, I thought it'd be so much more fun if I kind of took it another level and learned how to code and learn how to build my own applications. Um, and so I had a lot of fun with it. I got into Code Academy and I learned a little bit of Python, a little bit of JavaScript, and started just kind of build some ideas and, and build some small applications that I thought would be fun. And the one application that I'm gonna spend the most time on today that we're gonna kind of use throughout this talk is the one that I've been working on the longest. Um, I've got a couple 100 or 200 users for it. Um, and so this is one that's been kind of my learning tool throughout my, my career at AWS. Uh, the other thing that's important to mention for this talk to kind of set the scene is that while I don't have a tech background and I'm kind of building that up over time, I do have a Chinese language background. Um, so I love Chinese, I studied it in undergrad and in grad school and I lived over there for a couple of years. 
Um, and so that's always been a big part of my life. So my idea for an application, and this is an application that I wanted to build to be able to, to learn a bit of serverless, to be able to build with serverless services. Um, and the app idea and the problem that I wanted to solve was just finding a way to reintroduce uh, reminders, regular reminders to study Chinese into my daily routine. So the idea that I had for this, this is kind of the, the high level architecture idea that I, I thought I could put together for this. I wanted to have some kind of daily schedule to be able to say, okay, once a day we're gonna fire off a reminder. I needed some logic to be able to go into a database of vocab words, pull out a word, and I need some system to be able to send that word over to a user, so some kind of notification, whether it's email or text or something along those lines. So that was the application that I set out to build as kind of my, my learning project. But there's so many different things that you can build with serverless. So here's a couple examples, and I've kind of grouped these into two categories. Blue is stuff that's kind of in the, like, the realm of, of applications, like the one that I'm building, a Chinese language learning app. Um, and then the green ones are actually ones that in my role is in business development, that the customers that I'm working with, these are the kind of enterprise level of serverless applications that they're building. So I want to give you a sense of, of you can build small things and it's, it's great for, for building those type of things, but then these are also some very real world use cases. So stuff like um, on the kind of side project side, we've got maybe you have an app that checks a weather API and tells you what to wear, or uh, something that's hooked up to an IoT camera that identifies birds in your backyard, or maybe a home chore tracker that gives you some updates and has some leaderboards for your family. And then on the really kind of enterprise and, and uh, real scalable, uh, scaled application side, we've got stuff like e-commerce applications that need to handle Black Friday traffic. So handling those massive amount of peaks without needing to scale up a ton of infrastructure beforehand. Um, or stuff like automating the manual work and the checks that go into when you file for, um, have some kind of financial document. So a loan application maybe and needing to, to run those checks and use some AIML and the documents that are being submitted. And then lastly, another use case is uh, around integrating events from the other applications in your ecosystem, uh, maybe SaaS applications like Salesforce, pulling in some of those events and then building applications on top of them. Uh, so there's a ton of different things you can build with serverless. Uh, just wanted to give you some ideas outside of the realm of, of the language learning app that we're gonna be talking about today. So next up, I wanna jump into some of the services that we're gonna be using. So I've talked a lot about serverless, but just in case anybody needs uh, kind of a refresher on, on what is the core definition of serverless, serverless is all about letting you run code without managing the underlying servers. You're never touching them, you're never provisioning them, you're never scaling them or patching them or any of that stuff. That is all offloaded to AWS and that's stuff that we do on our side automatically that you're never thinking about. You're just running your code. It all scales up and down automatically, give you that built-in high availability for your applications, and you've got this wonderful pay-for-use billing model, so you're only paying when your code is running. You can scale up to handle a peak, and then you automatically scale back down and are back to a, a lower cost rather than being over-provisioned. With all that in mind, you get to take so much of that time that you would have been spending on building a scalable architecture or building these different pieces on your own, hand that over to AWS, and just focus on, on what makes your application unique. So now I want to talk a little bit about the uh, serverless toolbox. So what are the different services that come into play as you're building serverless applications? So the first off, the, the one that uh, we talk about a lot and that's going to come in a bunch into this session is Lambda. So Lambda is your compute. Lambda functions, you can run any type of code, just put a piece of code onto it, um, and it runs when it's invoked by an event. Um, so in this case, we're talking about like uh, a calendar event or a scheduled event, um, but it can also be events from, from other AWS services. Anything can kind of trigger Lambda function to, to run your code, and so Lambda makes up a lot of the different uh, kind of backbone of the serverless applications. Next up for our serverless application, we're going to need uh, some way for our front end to talk to the back end. Um, some way for users to interact with the back end of our application. And for this, we need APIs. Um, so we've got API Gateway to handle that for us. Next up, we need storage. Uh, so we've got uh, S3, which allows us to, to upload files, um, or something like DynamoDB, so a database um, for, for storing the data of our application. Next up, we've got this whole layer of integration services. I mentioned I'm go-to-market for application integration, so these are all mine. These are really fun services um, that 
do a lot of different kind of glue between your applications, stuff like SQS uh, is, uh, allows you to create queues for sending messages. Uh, SNS allows you to publish messages to topics, fan those out to a number of different consumers, or send messages as text messages or emails. Um, EventBridge allows you to uh, receive events and, and route those out um, to different consumers. And then Step Functions allows you to build workflows. So compose different AWS services into an order of this step first, then this step, then this step. Um, and I've got some examples that go into more detail later to talk about each of these services coming in. Next up, going back to the front end, we need some way to host our static content. Uh, so the content, the HTML, and, and all those pieces of our front end, um, we have Amplify for that. And then lastly, uh, if we have uh, users that are need to sign into our website or some kind of authentication, uh, we can use a service called Amazon Cognito. So all these services come together and have loads of different uh, kind of managed functionality and built-in feature sets to allow you to build serverless applications very quickly. So this was the MVP. So if you think back to that kind of conceptual architecture that I wanted to build for the application I had in mind, this was the very basic kind of bare bones uh, MVP that I created for it. And this is the, the serverless services that I pulled in for this. So to be able to send that scheduled daily event, I've got an uh, Amazon EventBridge scheduled event. Um, we actually just launched, uh, I think last week, Amazon Event, uh, EventBridge Scheduler, which is a whole new feature set for time zones and all kinds of other support for, for that particular feature. Uh, that triggers a Lambda function, which has some code that pulls a CSV file from S3, pulls all of the words in, and picks a random one for that day. Then it sends that word off to a uh, simple notification service, or SNS, uh, which sends that out as a text message to my phone. So this is the, the super basic MVP that, that I had set up um, to just get kind of that core functionality going for my application. Um, and I want to hover on this one a little bit just to talk a little bit about the uh, developer tooling and to really use this MVP as an example in the next section. So to give you an example of what Lambda function code looks like at this stage, this is the function code uh, slightly abbreviated for the Lambda function at this point. Uh, this is just uh, pulling that uh, vocabulary word from S3 and sending that text message off. So just to unpack this a little bit, um, I'm working with Boto3, uh, which is the Python SDK for interacting with AWS services. I'm instantiating a client for S3 and SNS so that I can make calls and, and work with those services within the Lambda function. And then I've got my Lambda handler. This is the piece of code that gets invoked every time that this function is, is triggered by that event. I've got a comment where I would call it to S3 if I had more space in the slide. Um, but I'm basically pulling in a vocabulary word, assembling a message, and then I've got a little bit of error handling wrapped around my call to SNS to publish that message to a target ARN. Um, and that target ARN, I have my, my personal phone number subscribed to that topic so that I'm receiving those text messages. So this is all the code that you would need to be able to run the application at this level of, of MVP. So let's talk a little bit about some of the development and kind of tool chain that, that goes around this. At the very beginning of, of developing serverless applications, I spent loads of time in the console and loads of time with this lovely button uh, that allows you to test out your function code right then and there. So when you're just kind of playing around with Lambda, getting a feel for how it works, writing some code, testing it, seeing what comes out of it, uh, the console is a great place and has a lot of kind of built-in stuff that you can see visually, okay, what's going on in this function. So this is a great way to just kind of play around and, and get a feel for Lambda functions. As you get past the stage of, okay, I'm just playing around with functions, I'm just seeing kind of what they look like and, and how they work, and you start to think about, okay, I'm building an application that I want to be able to make changes to, I want to update over time, I want to deploy as kind of one unit rather than configuring things manually in the console, that's when I really recommend that you choose a serverless infrastructure as code framework. Uh, so you're defining your entire application as code, all of those changes are saved down, so if you need to roll back to a previous version of your application, or you want to make sure that you're configuring things the right way every time, an infrastructure as code framework is going to be super helpful for that, and really make your application maintainable over time, as you've got all these different, all those services coming into play and making your application. There's a lot of potential choices that you have for uh, frameworks, and there's a lot of great ones out there. There's things like the AWS serverless application model, or AWS SAM. There's serverless framework, which is one of our partners. And then there's also uh, the cloud development kit, or AWS CDK. Um, I've heard talk to people that love all of these. My personal preference, the one I've spent the most time with, is AWS SAM. 
Um, so I've got some examples of that one later on. In fact, I have it right here. So this is the SAM template that uh, we would be using just for that, that MVP application that I showed. Uh, so I've got, in this, I'm, I'm just focusing mostly on the, the Lambda function definition. Um, so if you just walk through the SAM template uh, under the uh, resources, I've got my send text function. So this is defining that, that Lambda function. Um, I've located my, my Lambda handler, so this is the file where the Lambda handler is. I'm using uh, Python 3.8 runtime. And then something really cool is, is under that policy template, or that little policy section. So if you've worked with, with AWS services, you've worked with uh, IAM before, um, if you've ever seen an IAM policy, which is the ability to kind of authenticate calls between different services written out as CloudFormation, it's really long. There's many, many lines of uh, kind of CloudFormation that will be able to, to allow you to have two different services interacting with one another. This one, you'll notice, is two lines. So SAM does a lot of simplification. It does a lot of uh, simplifying the amount of lines of code and infrastructure as code that you need to be able to deploy your serverless application. Um, so in this case, I'm using a SAM policy template, uh, which is that SNS publish message policy. And then I'm referencing a specific topic name. So I have very finely scoped permissions. I'm not saying, okay, this Lambda function can call any SNS topic, because that's obviously not best practice. I have it scoped down to this Lambda function can only send messages to this particular topic, the send text SNS topic, uh, which is uh, the comment at the bottom is where I would, would have the S3 bucket and the SNS topic. Um, so that's something about policy templates in SAM. Um, I've also got some environment variables that I'm pulling in so I can reference those within the function code. And then the last little bit is also really cool. So under events, this is where I'm creating the event bridge scheduled event that is going to trigger this Lambda function on a daily basis. Uh, so again, this is all the, the kind of four lines or so that I've got here that I would need to create that entire event bridge scheduled event and hook it up to the Lambda function so that the event bridge event is, is triggering the Lambda function and give the two permissions to interact together. So a lot of cool stuff is going on behind the scenes that Sam's doing to allow me to really simply deploy my serverless applications. So now that you've got your, your function code written, your application is defined using your infrastructure as code framework, uh, now you're ready to deploy, deploy your application to the cloud. And for this step, um, again, because with the serverless application, you're gonna be doing so many changes to your AWS uh, the AWS resources and services that you're creating, um, I definitely recommend setting up an automated deployment pipeline, even if it's kind of a, a smaller application or, or something that uh, you're just kind of getting started working on. I think that this was a real kind of step change in uh, my kind of enjoyment of building with serverless, is just having a really easy automated way to add things to, to uh, GitHub and then immediately see them go live in the cloud. So there's a couple of different tools um, and lots of different options that you can use for, for setting up your CI CD. Uh, stuff like Serval CI and GitHub from some partners, um, also AWS Code Pipeline. All these are different tools that you can use to, to deploy serverless applications. So here's what that pipeline would look like. Uh, we have our application defined using a serverless deployment framework, uh, development framework like SAM. Uh, we have the code being, uh, so our code is uploaded into a new repository. So we've got a new version of our code hitting that repository. Um, the new version will launch a new build process, something like code pipeline. And then we've got our new application uh, deployed to the cloud and, and running and able to, to test and to be able to see how it's working in the cloud. So speaking of testing, this is a really interesting one because I think uh, a fair amount of people, this is, it feels very new to them to, to start thinking about testing in a serverless way where you, you're using so many AWS cloud services. And it's not something you can necessarily run as easily locally versus uh, other types of technologies. So in some, in some parts of my application, I am using unit tests to be able to, to test uh, Lambda function code locally. Um, so th in this case, uh, to write, if you're thinking about writing unit tests, I would definitely think about where you have a Lambda function that's got a lot of kind of complexity within itself. So within that function code, you're doing um, some complex logic and you want to be able to test, okay, is this Lambda function doing what I expect it to do? And so here's an example of a unit test for a function. Um, so I'm using the unit test framework, uh, pulling in my Lambda, Lambda handler. Um, and so what I'm doing is I've got some mocks here for those calls out to different AWS services. So call out to S3, I wanna mock what that response would be, call out to SNS, I'll put a mock there. And then I've got my, my test 
Um, so I'm, I'm patching in those, those mocked uh, function calls and running a couple tests just to make sure that, that all of those function calls are, or the, those calls out test three is being made once, the call out test and S is being made once. Um, at the bottom there, this is the test event that I would be feeding the, the entire test. So I'm, I'm feeding the uh, example and event bridge scheduled event payload to the Lambda handler to see what comes out of the other side. So one thing you'll notice here is that in this, this test, I've got a lot of mocks going on. I've got, I'm mocking S3, I'm mocking SNS. At a certain point, it's, it becomes a lot of work to kind of mock and be able to get these test payloads. Um, and it becomes a little bit of like, is, is this really telling me anything about this function? Is this, would it be better if I could just test against real, a real version of S3 or a real version of SNS? Because there's a myriad of options of, of things that you could get back from it. Um, and so if you're finding yourself that you're saying, hey, this, service, this function actually makes a lot of different calls to, to AWS services, it's really more integrating with different AWS services than doing kind of complex logic within the function itself. In that case, I would recommend just getting that code into, the, into AWS, into the cloud, and be able to test against real AWS services in a development account or in a development environment that you've set up in the cloud. This is gonna allow you to spend less time uh, trying to think about, okay, well, how do I mock a particular AWS service behavior? Um, there's lots of kind of complexity that goes into something like S3 or SNS or any of those services that you're calling. And so in this case, um, it definitely makes sense to kind of get those applications quickly into the cloud so you can start, start testing in the cloud. Now, one thing that people run into while they're, they're trying to test in the cloud is they say, hey, as my application grows, it takes a fair amount of time just to kind of get that whole deployment out. So it could take a couple minutes just as you're kind of waiting for, for new resources to create or new infrastructure to update. And so we created a tool to be able to help you with that. And that tool is SAM Accelerate. So what SAM Accelerate does is say that you're working on your application, you've just made some changes to the code, and you really wanna get it quickly up into the cloud without waiting for like a full build, a full like kind of update to all of the resources in the application. With SAM Accelerate, you've got now got a CLI command called SAM Sync that just allows you to take your function code and sync it up directly to the cloud. Uh, this is definitely something I would reserve for development environments because it can create a little bit of drift um, in kind of the, the application itself. Um, you don't wanna be making a lot of changes and, and make sure that you're deploying the whole thing after a little while so that you're not allowing it to drift too far. But this is a really nice way to just quickly get new code into the cloud and start being able to test it against real live AWS services. Cool. So we've talked a little bit about serverless services, about the serverless developer tool chain, uh, touched a little bit on testing serverless applications and different approaches to that. Now I wanna chat a little bit about taking it, the application beyond just that MVP stage. Uh, so that was really kind of the first step of the application. And there was so, there's been so much kind of evolution beyond that and new services coming in. Um, and I think that that's a really nice example of how you can kind of take something small and just expand it over time with serverless. So phase one we're familiar with. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the MVP, just being able to send text messages. So at this point, I, I was pretty happy with the application, but I actually had a couple uh, friends or people that I knew that were also studying Chinese who said, hey, I would love to receive this as a service as well. Can I sign up for this? Like, this sounds really cool. And so I was able to at this point, I could go in and I could manually subscribe them to the SNS topic or add them, um, add like their emails or whatever else to, to the SNS topic. But it really wasn't very scalable beyond like five friends. Um, just because there's kind of that manual work that goes into it. And so I wanted to have a way for them to maybe go onto a website, have a little UI that they can subscribe themselves, unsubscribe themselves, I don't have to deal with it, and just make it something that's more kind of user-facing and, and create a UI for them. So to create a UI, um, or rather to create the back end that would power this UI, um, I moved, so the, the MVP has just kind of moved over to the right here. That's all the same. The only changes I've made to the, the MVP is I'm now using emails, um, which is a little bit more cost optimized um, than sending text messages, and so I've swapped out in, in for simple email service. But other than that, all of that is the same. The only thing that's different is now I have Amplify, which is hosting some static content, some, some HTML and CSS to, to show that front end of the website. And now I've got an API gateway, and I've got API endpoints that users can hit when they want to uh, subscribe themselves to receive, uh, receive messages with, with Chinese vocab words, or they want to unsubscribe themselves. And so those API endpoints are powered by API gateway. They've got Lambda functions behind them that um, are taking those actions once that API call uh, endpoint is hit. 
Um, and then they make those updates in DynamoDB. And now the, uh, the only change I've made to the Lambda function that's sending daily words is it's now pulling a list of, of who are my subscribers who subscribe to, this, uh, to uh, this particular list before it sends those messages out. And this is the UI. Um, I just made this in uh, Vue with my very limited JavaScript skills. <laughs> and uh, it just has a little bit of a UI for people to go in and say, I want to subscribe to this particular list um, and just be able to, to view a little bit of, of sample vocabulary as they're, they're signing up. So one thing that has changed in the application at this point, I mentioned I started out with some very simple uh, storage and, and data needs. I just had a CSV file with all of my vocab lists in S3. Um, as I had users and, and subscriptions and these things I need to manage, I decided that it would be better if I had a little bit more um, of a structured, uh, kind of like a database behind it rather than, than just using S3. So I kind of leveled up the, the database and the storage needs of my application. Now the database that I chose was DynamoDB. Uh, DynamoDB has a lot of awesome kind of optimizations and features for serverless, and it was really built with the serverless applications and developing serverless applications and developing serverless in mind. So it's got um, it's got the same pay-as-you-go model. It's got uh, you can use IAM to authenticate it and just make API calls to be able to interact with the data. And you don't run into to limitations that you might with another type of database. Uh, so maybe you have a database that has a cap on the number of connections that you can have open to it at a given time. Um, so you've got a Lambda function that's scaling up and needs to make a lot of calls to that database. It might overwhelm the database. And so DynamoDB is, it doesn't have that problem because it was built around this use case of, of interacting with Lambda. So DynamoDB is very cool, um, but it definitely has some, some differences uh, in the way that it's structured versus uh, other, or other databases that you might have interacted with. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of those. So DynamoDB is a NoSQL, non-relational key value database. Uh, this is different from uh, a SQL or relational database that you might uh, have worked with in the past, maybe something like RDS or something along those lines. Um, if you're working with uh, a SQL database, you're going to have the entire database um, on a single server or a single instance. You're going to have multiple tables, probably grouping like items together. Um, so I've got my users table with user123. I've got my list table with my, my three vocab lists. And then I'm writing a join to be able to pull, OK, what list is user1 subscribed to? So this is, this is kind of a data pattern that in a data structure that, that you might be familiar with. Now, some of the challenges that, that SQL databases run into and that DynamoDB has, has been uh, built to resolve is that the only way to scale up a SQL database is to just increase the size of that, that instance of that server. Well, one of the only ways. But the main way that you go to to, to be able to increase the amount of data that you want to hold on that, that uh, particular database is to vertically scale up the size of, of that database and that server that it's running on. Another thing that you run into with these kind of databases is in some cases where you have a lot, a lot of data and that data volume is increasing, you might run into challenges where uh, as the volume of data increases, the latency of the requests, so the amount of time that it takes you to make a call to the database and get that information back uh, can increase over time and, and slow down. So DynamoDB has, has uh, made some changes in the way that it's, it's structured and has built around some of these problems. And one of the ways that it does that is as you're uh, adding data to a DynamoDB uh, database, it actually automatically shards that data or breaks it up into chunks and puts it on different servers. So it's automatically horizontally scaling in the background. And that's not something that you need to build for or you need to think about when you're working with DynamoDB. With this, this data pattern, it also gives you the ability to have very low latency as your data volume increases uh, because it is kind of breaking that up and sharding that across a number of different instances. So these are really cool things that you get right out of the box with DynamoDB. Um, but then it does, uh, if you really want to optimize your, the way that you're, you're structuring data within DynamoDB, um, there's some things that you can think about to, to make your data structure a little bit better for it. So this is the, the data structure that I've used in my uh, implementation of DynamoDB. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about the thought process behind it. So. With DynamoDB, and I've got all my data kind of broken up across these, these different uh, instances, um, I want to make sure that the data that I'm pulling the most frequently is grouped together. 
And so to do this, I use item collections of kind of grouping together the, the data that I want to pull the most frequently. And I really design around my access patterns. So to take an example, um, thinking about my application, my use case is for a user to come into the website and they want to see their subscriptions, they want to maybe unsubscribe or uh, subscribe to a new list, and they're really interested in the list that they're subscribed to. And so that's kind of the access pattern is I'm gonna be searching for, querying my database for a particular user and all of the information about them, their metadata, their list that they're subscribed to, um, so just about that particular user. One of the access patterns that my application is not interested in is looking up all of the users. It's just gonna have one user signed in at a time, so it doesn't really need to have all the data about kind of the whole group of users. And so you really wanna kind of refine a little bit and say, okay, what is my application gonna be solving and what are the kind of frequent calls it's gonna be making to the database um, and then design your structure on that. So in this case, I've got uh, a user and then I've got all of the information about them kind of grouped with them so I can get that really easily. So this is a super interesting topic. Um, I've loved working with DynamoDB and I think it's a really cool service. Um, I highly recommend if you are interested in getting deeper into this and kind of learning to build with Dynamo, um, Alex Debris is an AWS here that's written a ton about this. And then um, I spent a lot of time with his DynamoDB book. Um, I thought that was a really great resource. It has a lot of kind of real world examples about designing to really optimize for DynamoDB. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about uh, kind of the iterations and getting up to the point where we have a UI and the ability for people to, to log in and subscribe. The next phase is I thought that it'd be really cool and it would open up a lot more features if rather than just a user kind of coming on and saying, okay, here's my, here's my email, subscribe me, they have the ability to, to have a user profile. So they've got a username and a password, they can log in, they can see their homepage, they have a little bit more ability to kind of manipulate the list that they're subscribed to. And then this would open up the door for all kinds of features down the road. Maybe I have uh, quizzes, so vocab quizzes that they can kind of track the results over time. Any of that like personalized data that they wanna be able to see about themselves and about their progress, um, having some, some user profiles and some authentication in the website is gonna allow me to, to open that up. So this is the, the only change that I made to be able to add user authentication and user profiles to the back end. Um, I've added uh, two new Lambda functions and two new API endpoints, one that gets a user da user's data and one that updates the user data. And both of these are protected, so they uh, require a call and authentication through Cognito to be able to successfully access that API endpoint and manipulate data from there. And here's some little UI that I added, this time the mobile version. Um, so this is just a, a little user profile um, where you can go in and you can see, okay, these are the words I'm subscribed to. I can manage my, my profile settings, so I have a username. And then I can also go, go in and manage my lists. So I'm subscribed to level four and level six, and I can go in and subscribe or unsubscribe or, or do a little bit more uh, kind of manipulation of my own personal subscriptions here. So that's kind of the, the iteration and the evolution of the core of the application and adding on different components. I wanna talk next about some of the ways that I've extended the application to new features and some of the, the kind of strategies and, and approaches that I've taken to say, okay, this is my base application. How can I really easily expand it to, to new features or make it easier in the future for me to kind of extend and, and grow this application over time? So one of the ideas that I had was I already had my vocab words being sent out as emails. Um, what if I had the ability to also publish those onto Twitter with a tweet bot? Um, so I had to think about, okay, how do I gonna change my kind of core functionality of my application in a way that easily extends it to, to Twitter or maybe to, to further kind of places that I can publish my uh, daily messages? Now, the first thing that I thought about was it probably makes the most kind of obvious sense to take that Lambda function and to just add another couple lines of code that says, all right, right after you've sent the email to everyone, just go ahead and send a tweet. So while it seems like this would be kind of the easiest first step to take, I was already finding that this Lambda function was doing entirely too much. It was becoming what some people will call a mono Lambda, so it's just got so much functionality packed into one Lambda function. And it doesn't really impact the like, performance or the ability of that Lambda function to 
um, do what it needs to do, but it does impact my ability as a developer to really easily go in and make changes. Because if there's a lot of different things going on in this Lambda function, I find it a little bit harder to go in and say, okay, this is what this is doing. If I make a change here, it's not gonna impact here. And so this is, there's got a lot of different kind of things and, and logic in this Lambda function. I think it'd be much easier and much more kind of uh, pleasant to build with over time if I was able to split that up and have more kind of dedicated functions for different tasks. So the solution that I took in this case is I took, I kind of stripped down that original Lambda function and rather than doing both pulling the uh, information that it needed from DynamoDB, pulling the list of words and selecting today's word, and also sending out the email, now I have it just pull that word, so select, okay, this is today's word, and then it just emits an event. And it emits an event to an EventBridge event bus. That EventBridge event bus will match the event, see if it matches um, a rule. The rule is just looking for, for any, word, or any events that say today's word has been selected. And then it sends it out to consumers, consumers that are subscribed to that rule and that are looking for, for events that come from that rule. And I've got multiple consumers now. Um, and these are kind of, that send email function is just pulled right out of that original Lambda function. But now it's much more kind of concise and simplified and it's easier. I know everything that Lambda function is doing, super easy for me to go in and make changes or update things. Um, and it's just very kind of simplified and this is exactly what this Lambda function does. So I've got a consumer for sending the email, and then now I've got a consumer for publishing a tweet and getting that out on Twitter. Now, the really cool thing about this is that with that event kind of flowing through the application now, I can add any number of different consumers or different ways that I'm using that event in future features. So events are a really cool way to kind of open up the ability for uh, potential future consumers, potential future features to be able to consume the events that you're already emitting and be able to build on top of those. So just to take a quick look at the, uh, what's actually in the body of that event, so what's in that event schema. Um, I've got the source, so this is just coming from the vocab app. The detail type uh, is today's words have been set, so this, the word has been selected for today. And this is what I'm, I'm kind of matching on, is just that, that detail type. And then I've also got, so within the detail body, you can add kind of any information that you would like and as you're putting an event onto a beverage bus. Um, I've added an item potency key. So item potency is just, if I take multiple actions, so say that I, I have a function that says, okay, increment by one. Is it gonna continually add up until I'm up into like three, four, five, six? Or is it going to say, okay, increment by one. Once that's done, the outcome doesn't change. So you're not sending the same event and having uh, continue to change and continue to, to have effect afterwards. So I've got an item potency key. And what that does is it tells my consumers, check the item potency key, have you seen this event before? it's possible the event gets fired twice, and I don't want my, my, tweet, my Twitter bot to be publishing multiple times, I don't want my users to get spammed with multiple emails, so I just have an item potency key that says, have you seen this before? If not, go ahead and publish. If you have seen this before, don't take any action, you're already done. Oh, and here's some highlighting for you. Um, so this is the, the detail type that I'm looking for, um, and that I'm matching on so my consumers can know to pick up the right events. Um, and then I just explained a little bit about the item potency key and that unique identifier to be able to distinguish uh, events from one another. And here's the Twitter bot. Um, so this is what it looks like every day, uh, just another way that, that people can get those messages and uh, another way to kind of extend the existing app with just some, some minimal code changes. So another feature that I got, and this one I actually got a ton of requests from, from people that were subscribed to the application, was they really wanted the ability to have audio. So they wanted to be able to press a button and be able to okay, hear what this word is sounding like, hear um, the pronunciation, and be able to, to practice with it. And so this was a really frequent request. Um, I was a little bit uh, at a loss for how I was gonna get audio files generated for all this different, these lists of vocab words that I had, until I remembered that AWS has a service called Amazon Polly, which if you give it text, it will spit out a file of, of that text being read for a number of different languages. And so I thought, ah, oh, this is my solution. Now, I could have just written a little script that would pull from, from S3 or DynamoDB or wherever I'm, I'm storing my list at this point, and run through all of those, run it through Polly, update my, my DynamoDB listing so that that uh, audio file is now listed with um, the word and then have the, the audio file stored in S3. Um, I could have just written a script for that, but 
I thought it'd be really cool to actually add it as a feature and a component of my application because a future use case I'm thinking about is the ability for users to go in and upload their own uh, lists of vocab words that they want to subscribe to. And so they could go in and, and upload their own list, just upload the, the Chinese characters or, or whatever else they have, and then the application does, it runs this workflow in the background that calls Polly, creates these audio files for them, and uh, gives them that uh, added feature for their own user-created lists. So with this in mind, I wanted to build this as a full-fledged feature of my application. So because I've got kind of a workflow, I've got um, a number of data that I want to run repetitive actions on, and a couple different AWS services that I want to pull in. The obvious service that, that stood out to me to use uh, for this was Step Functions, which allows you to create workflows and state machines that pull in different AWS services, and you can tell it what order you want to run them in, what kind of failure behavior, behavior you want to have, um, lots of different functionality for, for building workflows with AWS services. And the really cool thing is that last year, Step Functions launched Workflow Studio, which is this beautiful visual editor for being able to drag and drop AWS services. It outputs um, infrastructure as code that you can then pop into your de uh, deployment framework. And um, it's just a really nice way to be able to, to visually create these, these Step Functions workflows. So this is the workflow that I created uh, for this particular use case. Uh, first off, I've got a Lambda function that pulls from my data store, uh, okay, get the, uh, the word list or a chunk of the word list for the words that I want to be able to generate audio for. Next, I've got a map state. Uh, so map is just uh, looping through uh, data or iterating over the data. Um, and so I have it pulling each word in that list that I, gen that I pulled from, from my first step and iterating over each, each of those words. Here we go. And the next two are actually really cool. So prior to, to, again, about this time last year, these next two steps would have been Lambda functions that called Polly and a Lambda function that called DynamoDB to update the item. Now, Step Functions has a direct integration with all of these AWS SDKs, and so Step Functions makes the calls for you. That's another piece of code that you're not needing to write, you're not needing to test or maintain that code. It's Step Functions just directly calling the AWS service for you. So it calls Polly. Polly generates an audio file and gives you back a, um, a little uh, information about where that file is gonna be stored in S3. Then that information is passed on to DynamoDB, which uh, the, the record for that word is updated to say, hey, here's the S3 location where that audio file is. And then lastly, this is another cool feature of Step Functions. So I know that the Polly API has a rate limit. So there's only a certain number of times that I can call it without it giving me errors and saying, we're overwhelmed, we can't take your request anymore. And so Step Functions has a wait state. So at the last step of my workflow, um, I want to wait a couple seconds just to make sure that I'm not over overwhelming a poly. The last step of my workflow is just a check to see is there more words to get. So the Lambda function only retrieves a certain number of words, um, just a batch of those words. And if there's, one, if there's further words to get, it'll go back through the whole process. And if we're done, then the uh, workflow ends. All right, we're nearing the end, and I always get this question about uh, how much exactly does this application cost? Um, so I mentioned I've got uh, over 100 active subscribers, um, a couple thousand API gateway requests, Lambda invokes, um, CloudFront requests, S3 requests, all these different things are, are kind of going on in the background every month to be able to power this application. Um, so think about for a moment what you would expect this application to cost. Cost a whopping 82 cents. And most of that is in the registering the domain name. So that kind of, it's not, it's not quite about kind of the serverless services that power it, but a lot of these are benefiting from the really substantial free tiers that a lot of these serverless services have. Um, and uh, even some of the services that are, I am getting billed for are just a couple cents per month. Um, and this is, I think this, this particular use case especially, because there is, some of those requests come into play when a user goes onto the website and uh, is kind of making API calls or updating their information. But most of the kind of the highest activity of the application is just once a day when it sends that scheduled event and says, okay, send emails to everyone. And so that's a really great use case for serverless where it's all right, you need to scale up your resources once a day and then scale back down to absolutely nothing for the rest of the day if nobody's on the website. Um, so a really good use case for serverless and one of the reasons why this application is less than a dollar per month. Okay, so to wrap us up, 
Uh, just to summarize a couple of the tips that I've gone over in my personal serverless uh, building journey and, and learning to build applications and, and some of the things that have worked really well for me that I'd recommend that, that uh, you kind of put into your practice as you're starting to, to build serverless applications. The first one is choosing an infrastructure's code framework and making sure to deploy your applications that you want to maintain over time and, and build and deploy over time uh, with that framework. The next one is making sure to, to automate your deployment pipeline so you can get code up into the cloud very quickly. And last one is uh, write some unit tests where it makes sense if you have a Lambda function that's doing something very complex within itself. But if your Lambda function is doing a lot of calls to other services or interacting with a lot of AWS APIs, it makes a lot of sense to get that code as quickly as possible into the cloud and test against real cloud resources in a development environment. As you're thinking about your application design and your architecture, um, when you're working with uh, your database, if, if you have chosen DynamoDB, um, you definitely don't have to, to choose DynamoDB. It's not mandatory with building serverless applications. Lots of people use other databases. Um, but from my perspective, if you're, if you're building a new application or you don't have very strict database requirements or, or reasons to choose other things, I think DynamoDB is, is a great default or one to, to look at. Um, and if you're building with it, definitely think about your access patterns and thinking about building around item collections. Um, you can use workflows. Uh, to orchestrate services and to be able to, to nicely kind of compose those and, and handle uh, different uh, error behavior, retries, or, or looping over different, uh, different things. Um, and then there's a great ability to extend your application with events. So emitting an event, allowing any number of downstream consumers to pull up that event and, and take some action on it is a really nice way to, to very easily uh, extend your application and, and build on top of it. So I hope that you come away from this talk with a sense of, of how to build serverless, what are the services, what are the best practices, um, and just the sense about uh, when you are building with serverless, you're handing so much of the kind of boilerplate foundational work of getting an application off the ground over to AWS and just able to focus on what differentiates your application and what uh, you really need to, to build to get that application out the door. Um, these are some of the ways that you can check out more of the stuff that I've been talking about. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff linked off of my Twitter. This is uh, how Tintin is the website that I created. Um, and I've also got all of the code for that website open source um, at msha slash vocab on GitHub. Um, so these are some ways that you can find out about this app specifically. And a really great resource if you're looking to uh, just find serverless content is serverless land. Um, so serverlessland.com is uh, created by our developer advocate team and they have all of the great content about building serverless there. And lastly, um, there's a really cool uh, program in AWS Skill Builder that's launching to help you build up serverless skill set. I think that this link might be live tomorrow. So if it isn't live now, check back tomorrow. But um, this is going to be a really great way for you to, to build up serverless skills and to kind of get a great foundation for, for building with these services. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate all of your time. Um, definitely feel free to check out the survey and appreciate it. Thank you.